Okay, hello and welcome everyone to the Limitless Careers Week. And this afternoon's panel is the Physics in Medicine, and we're celebrating National Careers Week in the UK. And these sessions are organised by the Institute of Physics and a fantastic opportunity to learn about all the different types of careers that physics can open up. So my name is Dr Yolanda Ohini and I'm a researcher at the University of Manchester. And so my research is developing new MRI techniques to look at the brain. And specifically, I'm interested in diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and how we can use MRI to kind of help to better understand diseases like this. So I'm also joined by four fantastic speakers from all over the world in science. And their jobs look at physics and medicine in all sorts of ways, but they have they all have got one thing in common, and that's that they do physics, and physics has helped them to get here. So we'll hear from each of the speakers and have a chat about their exciting careers, and then it will be over to you. So please send lots of questions. Um, so when if you have at any point, if you have a question, add it into the uh, chat function, and we can pick it up, and, and we'll do our best to answer them. So this afternoon speakers, we have Lauren Byrne. So Lauren works as a medical physicist um, in the Galway Clinic in both radiotherapy and nuclear medicine departments. Her role involves calibrating and testing machinery and equipment in these areas, such as PET, CT scanners, SPEC scanners, and radiotherapy treatment and machines. So she'll be telling us more about this. So she and her colleagues are also responsible for handling radioactive material that is used um, during certain scans or procedures and ensuring that all the correct protective measures are in place. So in her spare time, Lauren enjoys swimming, hiking, and going for a run with her dog too. Our second speaker is Sophie Martin. And so Sophie, from a young age, was fascinated by the ways in which mathematics could be used to describe the world around her. She graduated from Imperial College London with a master's in physics in 2020 and is now taking a PhD in University College London. Um, Sophie is keen to use her skills to help to tackle the problems of healthcare by imaging and modelling processes in the brain for dementia research. Physics really plays a key role in the, in the tools required to obtain and analyse the images. Our third speaker is Heidi Hernandez, and Heidi is a trainee nuclear medicine technologist at the Royal United Hospital in Bath. She completed a bachelor's in science in biomedical science in the University of Plymouth and is currently studying part-time for her MSc in nuclear medicine by the University of West England. Alongside studying, Heidi works in a nuclear medicine department at the hospital, where patients undergo specialist scans after receiving being radioactive injections. Outside of training, Heidi loves to travel and hopes to visit South America once the pandemic is over. And then our last but not least, our final speaker is um, Jamie Mburn Crook. Sorry, Mewburn Crook. And um, Jamie is a nuclear meteorolo ooh, I can't, meteorologist, so he'll be telling us more about this. And so what he does is he accurately measures radioactive material to make sure that nuclear medicine and power plants are safe. So he began working in the National Physics Laboratory at the age of 16. Some of his work includes um, this an the um, antiviral material used for the pandemic, creating CE. Uh, certified PPE for, for the NHS staff, as well as winning the Apprentice of the Year for his work in 3D printing for cancer research. So outside of the lab, he enjoys playing rugby and dog walking. So we'll shortly be over to Lauren to start our session, but don't forget to ask as many questions um, as you have. And um, if you have a specific speaker that you're interested um, in getting a, a response from, just put that person's name um, in the chat. So um, over to Lauren. <laughs> 
Hi, everybody. So as Yolanda said, my name is Lauren and I work as a medical physicist in the Galway Clinic. Uh, so it's in Ireland. Um, so I suppose to start, I'll just give you a quick outline of kind of how I got into the job I'm in. Um, so I study physics when I was in school for my final exams, and I absolutely loved learning about how I could describe the world around me um, with all these equations and um, how I could kind of understand everything uh, that was, you know, in from the very, very small to the really, really large. Um, so I ended up studying a course called theoretical physics in university, um, which was, it kind of sounds complicated, but it's basically a very mathematically, a very mathematical uh, look at physics. So um, how we can use maths to explain what we see uh, in the world. So I did enjoy aspects of the course, but towards the end of it, I just felt a lot of it was quite abstract and I kind of wanted something, um, I suppose, that I could kind of really understand how it applied to um, the world around me. So this is what motivated me to look into more applied branches of physics um, and then through a bit of research and speaking to people that worked in the field and also touring uh, hospital departments, I decided that medical physics sounded like it would be a good fit for me. So this led me to do a master's in medical physics. Um, and after that, I was able to uh, work as an intern for a couple of months and then finally secure uh, a full time position as a medical physicist. So that's kind of the intro of how I how I came to, into the job. But I suppose the bigger question is, what do I actually do? Um, so my job is mostly to do with using radiation in hospitals. Um, radiation is a form of energy, just like visible light. Uh, but it, the ones that we use in hospitals have higher energy. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of X-rays um, and then gamma rays are kind of higher energy again. So uh, if we could actually just move to the next slide, please. Um, so there's kind of two big areas you can work in as a medical physicist. So one is diagnostic physics, and this is concerned with using radiation to take images so that we can diagnose a patient. So, for example, you might have an X-ray to determine if you've got a broken bone. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. So that's like the images there on the left. The other two scanners, then the one in the middle is called a PET CT scanner and the one on the right is called a gamma camera. And these can take images similar to those at the bottom which are just kind of other ways of determining what's going on inside the patient's body. Um, so the other big area then that you can work in uh, is radiotherapy. Uh, just the next slide, please. So uh, radiotherapy uh, is focused on using radiation to actually treat patients. So for example, uh, the majority of them would be cancer patients. Um, and we can do that either using the big machine that we have there on the, the left-hand side. So it's called a linear accelerator. And this kind of treats the patient externally. Um, and it uses, it's kind of like a big extra machine. It just uses higher energy in order to kill the cancer cells. And then on the right-hand side, you can see a different type of, of treatment using radiation. So these little seeds that you see at the top, they're actually naturally um, let, give off radiation and we can place these inside the patient and it can kind of treat the cancer from the inside out. So um, these are kind of the two different like approaches, I suppose, to, to cancer treatment with radiotherapy. So I work kind of between the two areas, between the diagnostic side and the radiotherapy side. So my job has a lot of different parts. Um, so I'm responsible for making sure that all these machines are working correctly. So I have to do a lot of different tests on them to make sure things like, say, the, you know, mechanically the machine is working correctly or that the, the radiation that's coming out of it is the correct amount and the correct energy that we want, depending on what it's for. Um, and then another big part of my job involves troubleshooting. So I might get a phone call from uh, the machine during a treatment and they say the machine is cut out and we need to figure out what's wrong. So I kind of have to go and figure out if it's something that I can fix. So maybe it would be like a communication error between different parts of the machine and then I could fix that. But then if uh, it's something that's bigger, so say maybe a part has to be replaced, I would be responsible then for getting in touch with an engineer and getting them to come and fix that before that's uh, be able to be used clinically again. So um, I really like this part of the job because you can get a phone call with an error you've never seen before and you kind of have to use your knowledge and your, your skills to um, you know, figure out what's, what's going on and what the best action to take is. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the another uh, part of the job that I do is um, dealing with the radioactive materials in the hospital. So these are materials that emit radiation naturally. 
Um, so not like an X-ray machine, which you can turn on and off, um, but they naturally emit uh, different types of radiation. So the seeds from the last slide are one example, but we also, this can also come in like a liquid form that might have to be injected into patients for different types of scans. So um, you can see there in the, the first uh, picture on the left, this is the area where I would prepare those injections. And um, so as you can see, there's like a really thick uh, lump of glass there. So that's to protect the eyes um, and the actual uh, vial that contains the liquid is in, in case in that, that big gray thing, it's a, a lead shield uh, to protect the person that's, that's preparing those injections. Um, and you can see in the middle picture that the, the injection itself is actually encased in, in a protective shield as well. So that's to protect their hands during the, the handling of that. So handling and disposing of that material is it's really important that that's done correctly. Um, and that would be kind of the responsibility of the physics department. Um, as well as kind of making sure that the signage, like in that photograph, is correct and the, the waste bins as well. So I suppose that's a very, very quick snapshot of some of the things that I do. Um, the best part of my job is that I get to work in kind of a technical and scientific role, but all the work that I do has such a clear focus. So everything comes back to you know, being able to give the patient the best care, whether they're getting a scan or they're having treatment. Um, you know, whether it's, it's maths that I have to do or whether it's uh, equipment I have to fix, everything comes back to giving the best type of treatment to the patient. So I really like that there's that individual uh, kind of helping an individual on people on an individual level, as well as kind of the greater societal impact, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, that's me. That's kind of a brief idea of what I do. Um, and I just uh, I hand back to Yolanda. Thanks so much, Lauren. It's so interesting to see that, that both you're very much hands on with the big machinery and then also the traces and so on that you use to help to see the, the uh, results, which is, yeah, fascinating. So now we can pass over to Sophie. Yes, hi, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be on the call today. Um, I hope you can all hear me OK. You can? Good. Um, so I don't have any slides, but I thought I'd just talk to you for five minutes or so about my journey um, into my PhD position at UCL. So um, I thought it would be good to just start with a summary of kind of like my school journey. Um, so I essentially grew up loving maths, loving physics. And I have to say, um, even though I've ended up doing medical physics as my PhD, I wasn't a child who knew that this is what I wanted to do. I kind of just followed what interested me at the time. Um, so during school, that was very much the mathematical sciences. I really liked problem solving um, and just the kind of curiosity that came with science and finding out more about our world and how things worked. So I kind of just followed that passion um, throughout school. And when I got to college um, and exam time, I started to think a little bit more about what I'd want to do for university and kind of why I was so driven by, by subjects like maths and physics. Um, so I did kind of apply to do physics at university, which meant I needed to take subjects like um, further maths, um, mathematics and physics. I also took history um, because I was a student who kind of liked to have that balance of not just always looking at numbers constantly, but getting to kind of explore my creative side and, and writing and stuff. So I tried to keep a, a good mix. Um, and then I got to university and really, really enjoyed physics. So unlike Lauren, I did a um, straight physics degree, so not a theoretical one, which meant that I had a lot of opportunity to work in labs and carry out experiments in kind of like first, second and third year. And that was really cool because you start thinking a little bit about kind of the scientific process and how to design experiments and how to kind of quantify um, things like quantify uncertainties and, and how you present your results. So it was getting a little bit more technical and hands-on. Um, and during university, I actually carried out several internships. So this is kind of how I kind of knew that I wanted to do a PhD. I, I took my summer holidays as an opportunity to try out different things, um, whether that was kind of engineering roles at car companies like Land Rover and Jaguar, um, or kind of data science roles in energy companies. I just wanted to see all the different ways I could apply physics. 
Um, and when I got to third year and final, like the final years of university, we had a few modules on on medical imaging. So kind of like Lauren, what Lauren talked about, um, how X-rays are used to diagnose people and all the physics involved in like, how X-rays actually interact with the particles in our body. Um, and for me, that was like the moment I knew that I wanted to kind of use my physics for what in a way that I felt would actually like help people on a day to day basis. I think it was a revelation to see um, how the power, what, what the power of physics in terms of like medical imaging and understanding how we work and how we operate. So um, from there, I kind of applied to a degree, which well, a PhD course, which I'm on now called um, a CDT in AI and medical imaging. So it's essentially bridging the gap between machine learning and medical imaging. So I'm sure um, quite a few of you may have heard about medical imaging. It's quite a popular term at the moment. And uh, my research is all about kind of uniting the two and seeing how we can train machine learning models to um, help diagnose diagnostics. Um, in particular, I'm looking at dementia. So um, Yolanda actually mentioned Alzheimer's in her introduction. Um, and it's quite a big problem with our aging population. You know, they're predicting an increase um, in the number of people living with dementia. So my research is all about how we can kind of better predict that um, earlier on in the pipeline and, and kind of see if we can kind of fight that battle. So yeah, that's a brief intro about me. Thanks so much, Sophie. And it's really nice to hear um, the different interfaces or the different experiences that you've had um, to be able to come to the conclusion of like physics has led you to medical physics. Um, so that's a, it's a nice um, trajectory that you've shown us there. So Heidi, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Hi everyone, uh, thank you for having me here today. So I'm Heidi and I am a trainee nuclear medicine technologist. Um, so I work in my department full time, but then part time outside of work, I'm also studying for my master's in nuclear medicine. So I absolutely love my job. It's really interesting. No two days at the hospital are ever the same. And um, basically what we do in our department is we see patients from all sorts of walks of life for different tests and scans. So nuclear medicine tests are very different to having an X-ray or a CT because nuclear medicine tests look at how your body is functioning or not functioning in some cases, whereas X-rays and CTs tend to have a look at your anatomy. So what's actually going on with how your body looks like on the inside. Um, so the main way that we do our tests is we usually inject patients with something radioactive and a lot of the time we inject them with a substance um, that is labelled with something called technesium and that's the radioactive bit. So what we do is we inject the patient, let that circulate around their body for a few hours and then we bring them back and we scan them under something called a gamma camera. So a gamma camera is a really interesting bit of equipment. It's basically this massive radiation detector that picks up all of the gamma rays that are coming from the patient to basically form an image of, of what's going on inside. So um, I actually have an example of, um, of what those scans look like. If we could go to the next slide. Perfect. So this is a, a whole body bone scan of a prostate cancer patient. So basically what we're seeing is a nice picture of the patient's skeleton. And that's because we've injected them with something called HMDP, which has been labeled with that radioactive agent. And what the HMDP does is it goes all around the body, but it, um, it, it combines itself with calcium and helps in bone remodeling. So that's why we can see the whole of the patient's skeleton because a little bit of that injection has been taken up all over the skeleton. However, the bits that I've circled in red, where, where it's a little bit darker, that's what we like to call in nuclear medicine a hotspot. And it's basically where more of that injection has concentrated itself because there's more bone remodeling. So the bone is kind of being repaired in that area. And that could indicate anything from a fracture to infection or metastasis. So when cancer has gone to the bones of a patient. So quite often doctors like to use this type of scan when staging different sorts of cancers. 
Um, so that's just one sort of scan that we do. And there are so many more and they're all so different and interesting. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to talk about them all today. But um, I encourage you to have a look at Hopkins, Hopkins Medicine, um, the website that you can see at the top there. Um, they explain a lot of the different scans, go into a bit more detail about them. And also um, the BNMS website is a really good page. Um, if you're interested in a career, a career in medical physics, it's another really good page to visit. And they've got some great videos um, that kind of explain a little bit about, more about what we do in nuclear medicine day to day as well. So um, me personally, I've had a bit of an unconventional route into this career. Um, when I was at school, secondary school, I always really, really loved science. And in particular, biology was my thing. And I always knew that I wanted to work in healthcare. Um, I did study physics, but I actually never thought it was something that I would need to use, especially um, going into healthcare. So um, I decided to study biomedical science at uni. And I found it really interesting. But when I got to the end of my degree, I realized I don't want to work in a lab. I want to work with patients every day. So after uni, I did a few different jobs whilst trying to figure out what it was that I really wanted to do. Um, so I briefly worked as a dental nurse and then I took a job as an administrative assistant in the hospital that I currently work in. Um, after a year of doing that, I saw a job going as a DEXA operator. And if you've not heard of DEXA before, it's basically a bone density scan that uses x-rays to measure how strong people's bones are. So I got that job and I really, really enjoyed it. And it was um, my introduction into kind of radiology and medical imaging. Um, so our DEXA scanner was based in our nuclear medicine department. So working there, I got to meet lots of nuclear medicine techs and they told me about what they did. And I got to see a few different scans and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. It's a nice mix of both science, which I loved at school and um, patient contact. It's like the perfect mix. So when the department started advertising for a trainee tech, um, I decided to jump at the opportunity. And um, yeah, here I am. So I feel really lucky because um, every day I get to come into work and do something that I really, really love. Um, and also we're, we're just helping patients as well at the same time. And it feels really nice to feel like you're contributing and making a difference to somebody's life, especially during like the pandemic at the moment. It feels nice to, to help people. Um, yeah, so that's me. Thanks for listening. And I look forward to answering some of your questions later on. Thanks so much, Heidi. And are you in the hospital at the moment? I'm just trying to locate you. Yeah, you can see the ugly curtains behind me. That's how you know that you're in a hospital, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is really very inter interactive. That's great. Um, so over to you, Jamie. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone? Yes, thank you very much. So I'm I'm Jamie Mewburn Crook. I'm a nuclear metrologist over here at the National Physical Laboratory. Um, and if we go to the next slide where we can start looking at what nuclear is, what, what radiation is. So today we've heard quite a lot of like gamma, x-rays, and the kind of idea is everything that we know of in the world is either mass or energy. And energy tends to be travel along these waves. And much like a wave on the sea, you can have long, slow waves, or you can have short and sharp waves. Um, in the low, we've got kind of our, our microwaves, our radio waves for our phones. In the middle, we've got the visible light that we see. And at the really, really, really high energy, that's where we've got the gamma rays. Gamma rays are fabulous because they can travel through people really easily, which is why we use them for medical imaging, so we can see what's going on. The problem we've found at MPL is whilst traveling through people that they can interact with the person and they might not necessarily travel in a straight line. And what this means to the doctor is they can end up with quite a fuzzy image. So in, if we take Heidi's images, for example, they're, they're brilliant at showing where the cancer is. But if I was to tell, ask you, where exactly is it on a cell by cell basis? That's when you start going, oh, I don't know. And if you went into an operation to remove the cancer and the surgeons there going oh I don't know that can mean that they have to remove extra tissue just because you really want to be safe rather better safe than sorry so if we switch to the next slide on some of the work I've been doing we take this pelvis phantom in the bottom left hand corner and this mouse phantom in the middle right or just in the middle top section that is where we've 3d printed like fake bones 
which interact with the gamma rays coming off very similar, we can write correction factors and we can try and improve the imaging. And if the surgeon is getting clearer images, they know where exactly the cancer is, they can leave some of the healthier tissue behind and therefore the patient, but if they've got more of their own tissue behind and they can just have a nicer life going forwards. The surgery isn't as impactful on the patient. Um, so beyond that, um, the kind of things I've be, I kind of work with and stand for is, so a lot of my stuff is 3D printing related. Um, in the top right, as the pandemic kicked off, this idea of we needed PPE, uh, but beyond that, we need a PPE that works. And we, there was quite a famous story about a shipment coming in from Turkey and we actually had to say no to it because it didn't meet standards. So MPL is a national measurement institute or someone who works very closely with standards. We came up with this CE certified design so people could print off their own face masks at home and provide them to hospitals with whilst knowing that it's going to be accepted because it met a CE certification. Um, and yes, yeah, so as we can see on the far right hand photo, I printed off about five, six hundred of these for going into hospitals. Um, so those are some of the things that I've done historically. If there's anything on there that catches your eye that you'd quite like to ask me about, please drop it in the q and I'm more than happy to ask any questions, answer any questions even. And the final point I'd like to raise is I'm even... I'm a very different person in how I've got into science. Um, we earlier had a question, were you naturally good at school or naturally academic? I was naturally good at tests. No, naturally good at learning, naturally rubbish at tests. I could not do them to save my life. Um, I'm, I'm dyslexic, which again, doesn't help. But what it meant is dyslexia is not something where may, which makes people worse, but rather an imbalance where you may be worse at spelling or time management, but I was, in my case, I was quite good at 3D thinking. And it really helped when I left school at 16. Uh, and so leaving school, it, I was 16 years old in 2018. And this is a timeline of what I've been doing since I've left. So that's my kind of final thought is you can actually go into science and make a real impact even if you were just leaving school, even if school's not for you, that doesn't mean that science isn't. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jamie. It's such an interesting variation of the different work that you do as well. And I have to say that I'm dyslexic as well. And so numbers and timekeeping are not my thing. No, numbers are my thing, but writing is not my thing. So um, I suppose we all have to kind of play on our strengths as well. And I think that that's a really important and really important point. Thanks so much for sharing. And um, so I have a few questions for the panel and I see that lots and lots of questions have come in on the q and so keep them coming as things come up. But first of all, I'm really curious to know for each of you, um, what's the thing that really like motivates you um, with your job at the moment? Like what's the thing which gets you out of bed in the morning? So perhaps, um, perhaps we go over to Lauren first. Great. Um, so I suppose the biggest thing for me is when I did physics in school and university, I kind of thought of, you know, that when I thought of physics, I thought of working somewhere like CERN or, you know, the, these big um, particle accelerators. I'm not sure if people are familiar with them, but, you know, working in a lab, you know, you think of Einstein, Newton, all those type of people. And I didn't really think that this kind of uh, impact you could have on it, kind of individual people was something I would get in a physics career. So I suppose one of the biggest, even though it's not the only thing I like about my job, one of the biggest motivators for me is that um, kind of connection to helping people and, you know, being part of somebody's journey and something that's, you know, being part of a patient's treatment, you're kind of a link in the chain of, of helping get that person hopefully get better. So I think that's like the biggest motivator for me. And Heidi, how about you? <laughs> Um, well, there's there's a few things, really. I think um, number one is just that I know that every day is going to be different. I've got quite a short attention span. 
<laughs> so I don't like to be doing the same thing for too long. So although we might be doing very similar tests every day, it's the patients that really make it different. And you never know who's going to walk in the door or quite how your day is going to go. Some patients need a little bit more help. Some cases are a bit more difficult or you come across things that you might not have even expected on the patient's referral form. So that's um, really what I love is just kind of going into the unknown every day and being excited by what I find. Um, but also just the fact that it's the kind of job where you can continually carry on learning as well. Um, there's always new developments going on and there's always a, a course that you can take or, or a way to kind of um, just keep your brain ticking over. Great. And how about you, Sophie? Yeah, um, I'd have to actually agree with Heidi, especially that last point about kind of technological advancements. And I suppose um, even though I'm perhaps less closely interacting with, with patients themselves and people walking into the clinic since I'm doing research, um, it, it's nice when you when you do get that interaction with clinicians and often um, with research in medical imaging and kind of medical physics, there is a high focus on translation so how we can actually um, implement the ideas that we're, we're discovering um, at our desks per se but in the in the actual clinic as well so it's for me quite exciting and I suppose one of the big things I've I've loved as I've started my PhD is just seeing the breadth of applications of physics um, in imaging technology and it makes me quite excited about the future actually because the power of what we can do with with this radiation that we're hearing about today is is kind of endless and exciting yeah it's amazing the scope of, of thinking about fundamental physics but then applying it to um healthcare that's it's 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 really cool and jamie do you have anything else or or what would get what gets you out of bed in the morning um in a nutshell i love what i'm doing so for me as a child i'd I grew up in my granddad's workshop where we'd build things, we'd take a challenge and we'd solve it. And I love the process of solving a challenge. So I, after leaving school, I was like, well, what's the biggest challenge I can find? Oh, cancer, that's pretty big. And it's the actual manner in which we solve it. That's what I love. Yeah, cool. And another question that I wanted to ask each of you was um, maybe thinking about when you're younger or even now, um, who really inspired you to kind of go into um, the, the, this, this field? And because I know that I particularly got into or I chose to do a physics degree at university because I saw um, I don't know if some of you have seen him on the tv Jim Al-Khalili and he did a, a, a program called Atom and I and that was the first time when I was like oh whoa the scope of the universe and so um, I wonder who perhaps inspired you whether that's someone famous someone personal um, but um, if we go to Heidi um, so I would actually have to say um, my science teachers at school really inspired me, which I think is a, a nice thought looking back. Um, yeah, they were just really motivating and so knowledgeable. Um, yeah, I'd have to give it to my science teachers at school because otherwise I think it's quite easy. If you don't have the right teachers, it's quite easy to get kind of a bit bored, but they were great. And does anyone else have um, particular inspira inspirational um, figures in their in their lives to get to where they were where they are now? Yeah, um, Yolanda. So I actually, it's almost the same as I do. Like when I was, you know, under the age of sixteen, I I loved, loved maths, but I never really knew what physics was. I kind of thought physics was, you know, measuring things with the ruler and measuring curvy lines with the string, and that was, you know, that was all I knew about physics. Um, and it was actually the physics teacher in my school who had been my science teacher at the time convinced me to take it as a subject for my final exams and um, because he just thought I'd like it and would be suited to it. But lucky enough, because I, I didn't I didn't really know what it was and I took a chance and ended up loving it. But um, yeah, so really teachers and having it's not even just a teacher, but having somebody that can just let you know, you know, what's involved. And I think a lot of people maybe think, oh, that's not for me. That's too hard. But um, kind of like what Jamie was saying earlier, that you don't have to be like, you know, like a, a Einstein to to love physics, to be good at it and to get into a job that you love and um, that's related to it. Does anyone else have any any other 
any other shout outs that they'd like to mention? Uh, the people I'm really enjoying watching at the moment, uh, Brian Cox does a show, The Infinite Monkey Cage. That's fantastic. And then also Elon Musk is a great person to watch on YouTube um, just because he's got this charisma about him, but also the inspiration to go out and solve a problem. Those are two good YouTube watches. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, recently I've been listening to a lot of podcasts um, and there's one called Sean Carroll's Mindscape where he kind of just talks to people about science and it's not necessarily like te technical aspects, but it's kind of our interaction with science on a day-to-day -day basis. So like games, um, kind of like thinking about decision theory and probabilities um, that we encounter from day to day. So I quite like those, those kind of um, applications of science where it's very familiar. Um, and in terms of my, my kind of inspirational journey, it's interesting um, because physics was one of the most, like the toughest subjects I'd, I'd taken at school. I found it really difficult, even though I, I was good at the math side, physics exams are notoriously quite, quite challenging. So um, I definitely struggled during revision time to kind of just um, boost my grades and stuff. So for me, it wasn't like it was um, the easiest subject, but what drove me to still take it on towards university was just the fact that it was so broad. I felt like I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do with my job. So why don't I take something that kind of opens all doors and allows me to essentially pick later down the line. Um, so it was quite a practical choice for me to just take something that would allow me to go anywhere. Great, now we've got lots of questions that have come in. So we'll try and get to as many as possible and I'll try and kind of combine some of them that have come in as well. So I think firstly, quite a few different people have been asking, um, so what GCSEs um, did you enjoy, let's say? And also wh which subjects did you take at A level? So just to give, um, to give people an idea of, the, of your, your different trajectories to get to where you are. So does anyone want to jump in first? Jamie? Um, so GCSEs wise, uh, some of the more interesting choices aside from triple science and double maths was um, graphics, electronics, psychology, because I loved creating and being explorative. I think that's how you say it. Um, so yeah, this a whole idea of you don't need to enjoy science at the moment to become a scientist you need to enjoy the scientific process where you think about what's going on in your life and looking for the answer i think those are the two big things that really underpins every good scientist yeah, definitely. And I would add to that, that about the curiosity, because often in your science lessons, the math lessons, you are able to get to an answer. There's an answer there. But actually, when you get further down the line with exploring science, you actually realise that there's so many unknowns. And that's really what we're what we're delving towards and what, what we're trying to understand better. So that curiosity of like, I don't know the answer is really um, what a scientist is like, the, the essence of being a scientist. So Heidi, which what which pathway did you take? Could you just tell us your GCSEs and what you enjoyed? Yeah, so I think um, my choice of GCSEs and A-levels are probably a bit different to everybody else's. So I did um, triple science at GCSE. I did a bunch of things. <laughs> I did um, business, photography and French as well. So kind of a bit random. And then for my A-levels, I actually did biology, French and sociology. So I didn't even do physics at A-level. And then um, obviously going into biomed at uni and now kind of uh, life has led me into medical physics. It just goes to show that um, you can really learn something at any stage of life that you're at. So although I didn't do kind of physics at A-level, I've still managed to get to grips with it in the workplace and really come to love and enjoy and learn something about it. Yeah, I suppose there's so many different pathways that you can, that is available to take. And um, which which route did you take, Lauren? Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm from Ireland, so we don't have GCSEs or A levels. So um, we have kind of I think exams that are in this sim a similar time, so like the kind of junior cycle exam, um, which when I did it, uh, you, there was like eleven subjects. 
and I think eight, eight or nine of them are predetermined. So you don't have a whole lot of choice. Um, so the, my choices for that, I think, were um, like art and um, music. I think I did. Um, but, you know, we had to do maths and science. That was part of the curriculum for everybody. Um, so then we had a little more choice toward uh, our, our leaving set exams, which is kind of the equivalent to A-levels, I guess. Um, so we had to do at least seven subjects. So I actually did eight. I did three sciences as well. Um, and I did uh, accounting, which was quite random. I just liked the numbers. So, um, yeah, I think I always knew that I liked kind of maths and I enjoyed science. But, um, yeah, it was kind of it was kind of something I liked, but it wasn't, I suppose it's, it's a bit different because we have a bit less choice and definitely, yeah, there's less like options in terms of subjects we can pick as well. So uh, yeah, the Irish uh, cohort, maybe we don't have as much uh, variety, but that was kind of what I did anyway. And Sophie, what was yeah. your route? <laughs> um, so, I mean, in my school, we didn't have a huge number of options. Um, we only had two. So I had to take triple science and maths and English. Um, out of my options, I chose art and history. Um, I had to also take a language. I did a little bit of French. And so it was a bit of a mix, I suppose. I really liked history at GCSE and I continued that on. So I suppose if there's anybody who is wondering whether they could kind of mix the science with the kind of literature, literature subjects, you absolutely can. Even at university, um, there's opportunity to kind of do extra modules. So I did a bit of philosophy and um, explored that kind of area as well. Great. And so I have a question here that is in general, does medical physics involve a lot of patient contact and communication? So perhaps I've had your Lauren one. Do you have a response for that? Um, yeah, certainly in my job, um, nuclear medicine, the, the main kind of thing that we do is dealing with patients every single day. And I, I don't want to speak for Lauren, but we work very closely with medical physicists and they quite often come down if we have a problem like with the camera or like um, something's a little bit tricky with a patient and their injection and they come down and help us. So I think medical physicists do get some patient interaction as well. But Lauren, I wonder if you want to give your side of the story. Yeah, sure. Um, so I suppose I would say there's a little bit, it kind of depends. Um, like uh, Heidi said, uh, a lot of it would be kind of secondary. So like the people that are on the ground, the radiographers or the therapists might call us uh, when a patient is on the bed and you might have to come down and kind of, you know, fix something or, or figure something out in that context. Um, the main way that I would be interacting with patients is through uh, kind of a radio uh, radioactive therapy. So uh, it's called Svigo. Um, so basically, it's kind of like what Heidi mentioned, where you have a radioactive element um, and it's attached to calcium and it's to treat um, when there's cancer in the bone. So because I'm going down when that's being administered, I would get to kind of interact with patients there. Um, but that's just our hospital is quite small. So there are a lot of different types of therapies uh, where physicists would get to kind of deal with patients a bit more. Um, but definitely not as much as people that are, you know, the actual radiographers that are taking the scans or the therapists that are administering the, the radiotherapy. Great, thanks. Now, I've got another question here, which is talking about um, how uh, your work has changed in the pandemic and whether you think that scientists and medical scientists are more highly regarded now. Perhaps, Sophie, would you like to take that one? Um, so I just asked a question. Could you repeat what you, what you said? So thinking about how um, how your work has changed in the pandemic oh. and whether... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I saw this as I was reading. Kind of, yes, yeah. And whether, um, so it's just go over it again, whether it's, they've changed, like if scientists are more highly regarded now um, in the wake of the pandemic. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's a really good question. Um, and I think obviously with everything going on, all the eyes are kind of on science at the moment. I think it's really touching people's day-to-day -day lives. And I've found myself speaking about science more than I ever have with my family, um, which is, is kind of nice in a way. I think, I think um, it's nice because it's pushing science to be more transparent. I, I think maybe people in the audience might also agree, but as a child, I just felt like 
sometimes scientists just spoke a loads of fancy words, but we're trying to like cover up the truth or, you know, just make things more complicated than when necessary. And I think with everything going on now, there's a push for us to kind of think about how we communicate, um, what we're doing more and, and be a bit more open and honest. So I quite like that aspect. Um, and as far as my day to day, I suppose it's been strange because I started my PhD this year in the pandemic. So I haven't really experienced life outside the pandemic as a PhD student. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, when I'm able to go into, into the lab and into the office and interact with people, I'll also see another side of research um, through kind of just social interaction and learning from others. Great, thanks. And Jamie, I've got a question for you um, about um, like kind of advice for giving your best yourself the best chance to get an apprentice, a scientific apprenticeship. So for those who are thinking about taking a similar route to you that you have. The number one thing is enthusiasm. When you're going in at uh, on an apprenticeship, you are very much at the bottom of the pile. You you have to recognise that you haven't had as long a time in training. You have to recognise that you won't have the knowledge that everyone around you has. But that's uh, but so does everyone in the company. They know that, and so all they really want from you is someone who's eager to learn, someone who's going to listen, and someone who's once trained up will be an active part of the team. So yeah, my advice for anyone going for an apprenticeship is be passionate, be enthusiastic, and also don't be afraid to communicate how you're feeling and don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, I think asking questions is the number one thing for any apprentice to do. Great, thanks, Jamie. Really sound advice. And we've got a few questions about perhaps the harder parts of your job. So um, I would like to know um, what's first of all, the hardest part of your job? And second of all, perhaps, have there, have there been any times when you have decided, when you thought, oh, perhaps you won't be able to go on to the next stage? Because I know certainly for me, I found university quite difficult. And, I, and um, when I was an undergraduate, I thought, I don't know if I'll be able to succeed now. Um, but then I found out about um, kind of medical, the medical side of physics, and it really sparked an interest in me. And it it, it made me continue to be motivated in this area. So um, do you have, do any of you have a similar, similar uh, feelings about part that's very difficult or through your journey, what's perhaps been a tough time? Uh, yeah, well, everybody, <laughs> everybody <laughs> open at the same time. Um, well, I think um, working clinically, um, there's challenges that we face every day. Um, sometimes we don't get, because our radioactive injections, they come from a different hospital. They're not made here. So sometimes um, there are problems at the radio pharmacy. So we don't get our injections or things arrive late. Um so that can be quite tough, but I think the most important thing kind of um, in any scenario is just surrounding yourself with really supportive people that you can go to for advice. So I know my colleagues here are absolutely brilliant. And um, even with uni work at the moment, if I've got any questions, I can go to them and, and they can kind of help me out or share their experience. So, yeah, I think it's always really important to have good people around you. And Lauren, did you have something to add as well? I did, yeah. So um, actually really similar to yourself, Yolanda. So in terms of the path, um, I I would say that when I was leaving school, I was really passionate about physics and really interested and definitely just had the love for it. Um, but kind of over the course of my degree toward the end, I just didn't have that same kind of love for it because I think the area of physics in my head, I thought it's really mathsy. I love maths perfect but actually I like to see the application so toward the end I kind of you know because I just wasn't in the right branch of it and um, I think I kind of had lost a little bit of that spark but exactly the same as yourself as soon as I kind of thought about the medical side of physics and realized that this was a job that you can do and um, so you get to do physics but you have a really clear kind of focus and um, yeah it really kind of inspired me I suppose and I think like you said it's the motivation and the passion side of it like even if it's difficult you're motivated to work through that because you have the passion and, you know, for the, for the area you're in. And um, I think that's the key difference. 
Um, in terms of the day to day job, then I think for me, the kind of most difficult part is it's probably just the responsibility. Like um, there is a lot of things that, you know, there's going to be a, a direct effect on a patient if you do something wrong. But having said that and kind of tying in with what Heidi mentioned and um, having, you know, you're, you're working as part of a team and everything is checked so much and your colleagues are there to support you. So I think even though that is difficult, there is definitely um, supports there um, to kind of counteract that as well. Now, I have another question, which is actually um, a, a good one for this session, because it's what's the difference between um a medical degree and a biomedical degree. So perhaps Heidi, if you want to take that and if anyone else wants to jump in after Heidi as well. Um, so yeah, well, I, I did biomedical science. So um, we learn all about disease and the human body. So anatomy, um, medicines as well. It goes into all that kind of thing. I think med a medical science and biomedical science degree are the same thing, but nuclear medicine is slightly different because that's more to do with um, the radioactivity and um, the different sorts of like uh, physics that come into play within um, medical physics as well. So it's um, biomedical science is kind of like very broad and then nuclear me medicine is kind of a, a more specific kind of uh, thing that we do in hospitals, I guess. I don't know if anybody else could explain that any a little bit better. Because also I always think about, um, there's a lot of people who doing science degrees consider whether to do medicine or not. And so I think that, say for example, I did consider for a very short amount of time and I thought, no, it's not quite for me. But what I do now is I'm developing techniques which the doctors can use. So it's almost like looking at healthcare from a different angle. There's, instead of from the patient aspect, it's actually from like the, the tools aspect and from how we can understand, how we can understand the body in terms of um, like the research side of things. So I think that that's something that I, I never knew when I was at school that was, an, that was available. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to say I agree with you on that, actually. And um, I was similar in the sense that when I when I kind of decided science was for me at A-levels or, or college, I um, still felt like I didn't want to go down the medicine route and become a doctor per se in the kind of conventional sense. Um, so, yeah, I can relate to that definitely. And it's interesting now because I guess with the machine learning side, I'm in a similar way, I'm kind of more focused with the tools and kind of higher up the chain um, in a sense. And it's, it's, it's quite exciting, but I think um, I find like just the way that technology is kind of revolutionizing, revolutionizing that side of things quite exciting. Um, but it's something that I didn't necessarily know existed before ending up there, if that makes sense. I thought physics was physics and you could be a doctor, you see, it was like either or, you could either become a doctor or you could do physics and, and chemistry, but it's been really nice exploring um, the kind of intersection between the two. Great. Now we're coming to the last five minutes or so, so I think perhaps it might be a good idea to try and get through as many of these questions as possible. If we can just do a quick fire, a quick answer for each of the questions that I um, pose to you. So first of all, Jamie, someone asks, how long does it take to do a 3D scan and what are you 3D scanning, 3D printing, sorry, 3D printing? <laughs> Um, so, so I have just managed to sneak an answer in there, but it's about 50 millimetres cubed per second. Um, yes, uh, I think that's right. We, we run about 60 millimetres per second in going along the x-axis, and we are extruding a tube, like a tube of material, about 0.4 millimetres. Um, what that means realistically, so when we were doing the pelvis earlier, that was probably about two weeks worth of printing. Um, but naturally we fail quite a lot. Um, so we try, try, try again, and we can spend up to three, four months on a project before we're really happy with it and ready to take it to like the clinical setting. Great, thanks. And Heidi, what's your biggest achievement so far? Um, Sorry, it's a big one. <laughs> I know, that's really tough. Um, 
I, I would say being accepted onto the um, nuclear medicine course at UB. So obviously I'm, st- I'm still in the middle of my master's and still still doing that. But even being accepted onto the course and um, get, getting onto it um, feels like quite a big deal for me, especially seeing as I haven't done physics in the past. It just goes to show that if you if you work really hard at something, then, then you can do it and you can be successful. Great. That's really great. And Lauren, um, how do we produce gamma rays? Um, so it's kind of similar to the way um, an extra machine works. It's just that it, I, I'm referring to now the kind of treatment machine that we use for radiotherapy. So you basically have to get an electron, uh, which is like one of the particles that makes up atoms and um, which make up all of us and fire it really, really fast um, at a target of some kind. And when it hits it, it'll uh, cause the target to kind of produce what we call photons. So these are um kind of pockets of energy and uh, or gamma rays it's the same thing and they'll we produce basically a lot of them and that creates a beam and that's what we use to treat so uh, that is a very simplified version if you saw the inside of the machine you would you wouldn't describe it in that but that's my quick answer great thanks lauren sophie i've got a bit of a harder one for you um i've reframed the question but do you think that this that science is kind of an inclusive place to work that is a very heavy question, um, but it's a good one. I think um, we're, we're, it's becoming more so, definitely. And I think that there, there's definitely intersections that still kind of require quite a lot of work, honestly. But I think that, um, you know, as everybody's kind of, as light gets shed on the different intersections of society, I think there's efforts to, to make science um, more inclusive. Yeah, definitely. And I think lots of people are working quite hard to make it as inclusive as possible. And I think also what's what's um, necessary to say is that I think one of the things that motivates people in, in the field that they're working in is when you're passionate about something. So if you're really interested in working in this area, then I think keep pursuing it as well, um, even though there might be a few different challenges. Um, so Jamie, uh, what, which part of your job do you enjoy the most? Just every day where I'm solving a problem. Uh, earlier I said I loved the idea of solving a problem and that's the number one thing for me. Just finding the biggest challenge I can do and knowing I've made a dent in it. Yeah, great. Now, Heidi, do you think that science literacy is important and the, and also the study of, um, sorry, that's the same question in the second part of the question, but do you think science literacy is important? Um, yeah, I, I do think it is, but I don't think it's something that you have to kind of be a natural at. Um, I think when you go on to like A-levels and university and stuff, that sort of side of things just kind of develops naturally. The, the more um, kind of scientific papers that you read and people that you talk to, you kind of start to build up this vocab that you didn't have before. So don't worry if you look at research papers now and you think, well, what the heck is all, all of these words? That comes with time. And the further you go in your studies, you won't even realize it. You'll just suddenly kind of start to understand what these people are talking about. Yeah, and I think also to add to that is um, is you often hear about science capital as well, that science isn't just about studying the books, that it's also like being curious, maybe going to museums, um, doing your own experiments, all of these adds to kind of your scientific toolbox that we have that we can take that we can take with us so um, I'm just very aware of the time now so I think I suppose just to to close perhaps if each of you would say your your the most enjoyable part of your of your job um so Lauren sorry I was off unmuted um I think my the favorite my favorite part about my job it's been said already but it's the variety and it's the problem solving for sure that kind of challenge it's great yeah Heidi so I absolutely love working with patients I think if if you love science and you know that you want to work with people then um, a career in nuclear medicine or medical physics is definitely a good choice for you Sophie Um, I'd probably say alongside problem solving and kind of the knowledge that it's going to help people in the future, it it might contribute to that. 
I think just the um, potential, the potential for new technology and coming up with new ideas. Great. Thanks. So, um, sorry, Jamie, uh, um, not to miss you out. Um, um, I'd say the non-stop learning and the non-stop questioning. Yeah, brilliant. And from myself, I really love using the physics. So every day I do MRI coding. And then when you actually get an image that you can see, um, I think that that's really, it's amazing to think that we can see inside of the body. And um, so just to wrap up then, thanks um, everyone for the, coming to the session. And thank you to Lauren, to Heidi, to Sophie and to Jamie um, for your fantastic presentations. And like, it's so interesting and so varied. So before you go, everyone at home or at school or wherever you might be, um, please, we'd be really grateful um, if you could give us feedback about how you found the session. Um, so if you can just scan this QR code um, that's on your screens right now, um, it will take you through to a, a short survey. So do please let us know what you think and have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks a lot.